Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to chapel. It's good to see you uh, filing in on this uh, chilly Wednesday morning. I'm glad you're here. Please stand as we join together for our call to worship. It is good to give thanks to you, O Lord, to sing praises to you, O God Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the work of your hands, I sing for joy. Let us worship God. Please take your hymnal and turn to number 63 as we sing together, hymn number 63. Holy words 
and keep them in your heart. The Lord is God, the Lord alone. Give honor, thanks, and praise to God the Maker of all things and Giver of our days. You may be seated. By the grace of Jesus Christ, we are beloved children of God, members of God's own family, with the confidence of God's beloved children. Let us confess our sin. God of grace, for our failure to love others as you have loved us, forgive us. For wasting your gifts and hoarding our goods, forgive us. For losing heart and abandoning hope, forgive us. For all the ways we turn from you, forgive us. We offer our prayers in the name of the one who saves us, Jesus Christ. This is the gospel, the good news we have received, that our Lord Jesus Christ loves us and gave his life to set us free from our sins. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Grace and peace to you this day from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Holy Spirit. We are gathered together on, a, on this cold day. It's cold out there, isn't it? I, my name is John Martin and I'm a Presbyterian minister serving a sweet, sincere congregation in Abingdon. And thank you, Brian, Chaplain Alderman, Professor. What? Whatever, to, for inviting me. Thank you for inviting me to, to be a part of this chapel service today. I, I'm a Californian, and I'm a transplant to this area. So, uh, but I love it. It's, it may be the greenest place I've ever lived, uh, Washington County, Virginia, and then equally here in this part of Tennessee. Uh, very nice. We've been here 10 years, so I feel like it's, it's a good home. It's the second, I've lived in Abingdon 10 years. I've only lived one other place longer, which is my hometown, and, and that's in Northern California. And I don't know why, but when I was 18 and I just finished high school, I could not wait to get out of my hometown and get on with life. And now looking back, I think to myself, what was the hurry? It made perfect sense at the time, but now thinking back, it was more, what was the hurry? Well, uh, our daughter, whose name is Catherine, is a sophomore at VCU. So I'm the dad of a college student also, and we just sent her a care package yesterday. So, the, uh, so it is on its way to Richmond, and she should get it today or tomorrow, I think. So um, I hope she texts us an acknowledgement of the care package. So I, I, she's pretty good about doing that. She sends texts to her mo mother quite a bit. So um, we, as a parent, I need to text Catherine more and call her more. So I want to confess that to you and let you know that I plan to do that. And, and um, so I don't know why I'm sharing that with you, except that I'm staring at a bunch of college students <laughs> who probably know something about the frequency of, of text messages from parents. Did you get the, the care package, Catherine? Yes, Dad, I did. <laughs> She's an art student, and her whole life, she has been laser-focused on becoming an artist. And I'm, I'm proud of her, and 
I'm not a bit biased, but I will tell you that she is quite talented. And she has known from early on that she's wanted to study art, so it made perfect sense that she would apply to an art school. And it's amazing to see what that school is doing for her art. I mean, I think she brought some talent with her, and they're kind of pulling that out of her. So I'm really proud of her. And when she starts a drawing, and the paper is just blank, she'll might, she might make some lines on the paper. She has in her head what is going to be on the paper, but she starts by just making some lines on the paper. And there's probably some art term for that. I think of them as kind of layout lines, or lines that kind of give a general structure to the art that's going to be on the page that's in her head at the time. Does that make sense? Kind of layout lines, where things are going to go on the page. There's probably some specific art term for that, but that's what I'm going to call them when she asks me, what did you tell the students at King University about? I'm going to say, I bragged about how talented you are as an artist and that you start a drawing with layout lines. Here's why I'm telling you this. Mark, the gospel writer, is doing something similar in the first chapter of his gospel. He is giving some layout lines to all of us who, are, who read the gospel of Mark. And the first layout line he draws in the Gospel of Mark is in the very first verse, which begins, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So here is the layout line that he's giving us. Not, it's gospel news, it's good news, it's not okay news that we're about to read, it's not dreadful news that he's telling us. It's not tragic news that he's giving us. He's giving us good news. He's not, and this is a Presbyterian way of thinking about this. He's not telling us the plan B of the story because plan A didn't work. None of that. The layout line that Mark is giving us at the beginning of his gospel is good news. There's another line, layout line in chapter 1 that begins in verse 29 that I'm going to read. See if you can hear this second layout line in the Gospel of Mark. So with glasses on, listen to the Word of God. Mark writes, as soon as Jesus and the disciples left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him, Jesus, about her at once, and Jesus came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to Jesus all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door, and Jesus cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, Jesus got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for Jesus, and when they found him, they said, Everyone is searching for you. And he answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came to do. And Jesus went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, that's 10 verses from the beginning of Mark's gospel. And Jesus and his disciples are in Capernaum at the home of Simon and Andrew. And Jesus is, it's brought to his attention that Simon's mother-in-law is ill and he heals her, and then, and then the whole village seems to show up in the next verse, <clears throat> seeking some kind of healing touch from Jesus. And Mark writes, they gathered at the door, the whole city gathered at his door. Can you imagine how many people that is in one place, in front of one door, to get in front of one person? And this is still chapter 1, 15 chapters to go in the Gospel of Mark, 33 verses into the gospel, and an entire town has come to find Jesus. 
So there's a question for me around that moment. How ready is Jesus to meet that many people? And here's why I say that. The next morning, Mark writes, while it was still early and dark, Jesus got up and went off by himself to a deserted place to pray. Mark doesn't explain why Jesus went off by himself to pray, but one reason might be he went off to give thanks for all the work he had done the day before, <clears throat> to seek strength for all the work that was ahead in a new day. And that certainly sounds like something Jesus would do. And that's a great example for any of us to begin the day with prayer or with a chapel service to prepare for all that is ahead with some quiet time alone or with a community of people, anticipate all that's ahead for a new day. What a terrific discipline that would be for any of us to start the day in such a way. And that is certainly a traditional way of reading this text about Jesus getting up early to go off by himself to pray. But what if there's a non-traditional way of reading this text? What if Jesus didn't sleep well during the night. Imagine all of the people who he encountered the day before and the injury and illness and disease and, and, the, and the compassion built into that. What if all of that from the day before just didn't set with him well and he, he was restless all night and instead of just lying there staring at the ceiling... He decided to get up while it was still early and go off for a walk and find a quiet place to pray by himself and seek God's counsel. What if he was overwhelmed by the great need he saw in one village and he was planning to visit every village in Galilee? What if it took so much energy to heal one village and an entire world is waiting for him? So have you ever been awake at night because you were overwhelmed? Yes, me too. I see that hand, I see that hand. <laughs> Lie awake because you were sure the next day would be just as difficult as the day before. Have you ever gotten up early because you didn't just want to stare into the darkness anymore? I have done that. At times I it's been because I knew what was waiting for me in the new day would be just as difficult to endure as what I had experienced the day before. And I knew how much energy it took to get through that previous day and this new day would bring more of the same. Maybe that's why Jesus went off by himself to pray in that early morning hour. So when Simon found Jesus... He said, everyone is searching for you. And, and in that moment, there's, there's no indication of a pause in the story. But I hear one. In that moment, right after Peter says, Simon Peter says, everyone is searching for you. I hear this pause. As if all of us who are reading the gospel or Simon himself is waiting for what Jesus will say in that moment. 35 verses into the gospel, what if he says, I'm sorry, I, I can't do this? Or what if he says, it's just too much? If he says that, then the story, the story ends here. And it's not really even the good news Mark has given us as his first layout line. It's really not even okay news in that moment. So that's why I hear a pause there. Everyone is searching for you. And there's a pause. And then Jesus says, let's go. Let's go on and preach in the neighboring towns, for that is what I came to do. And then all of us who endured that pause breathe a sigh of relief. There will be a gospel story to follow that pause. There is gospel news in that answer from Jesus to Simon. And maybe Mark is showing us a human side of Jesus, a side that 
that knows what it feels like to be overwhelmed. Lesser souls might have avoided difficult ministry after a challenging day of healing and called it quits. But Jesus didn't. He was connected to an unending source of strength. Admittedly, a source that he could only hold one human vessel's worth at a time, and such is the mystery of the Incarnation. Let us go, he says, and, and they go on. But it also sounds like Jesus could have stayed in Capernaum. And as word spread of his healing ministry, people would have come to find him. Right? Maybe he could have just sat on a rocking chair on Peter's front porch. And his mother-in-law, Peter's mother-in-law, could have brought him lemonade from time to time. And he could have just sipped lemonade and sat on the front porch of that house and healed the thousands who would have come from everywhere to find him. But he didn't do that. Mark is not writing the story of a porch messiah. And here's the clue. It's in what Jesus says to Simon. He says, let us go. Let's go. Mark is telling us that Jesus will be an active Messiah, an AM, not a PM. And maybe that helps make sense of the sermon title. An active Messiah, not a porch Messiah. So he'll travel through Galilee. He'll seek lost sheep, heal people, find people, and teach them journey to Jerusalem, walk up a hill to a cross, and rise on the third day for us and for our salvation. Here's our claim, and here's where I'm going to take this text and put it to work for us. God has not stopped being active in the world. An active Messiah is still engaged actively in the church, in the world. And that means that we who are part of the body of Christ are still sent into the villages of Galilee with good news. So those words from Jesus, let us go, are words for all of us. So here, here is where they lead us. Let us go then to places where people suffer and bring them some relief. Let us go to places where people feel the pressure to be something they aren't and tell them they are made in God's image no matter what they are told. Let us go into communities of faith, communities of faith where visitors are considered a potential threat and remind them that visitors are welcomed guests. Let us go into places where people are so far apart with their ideas or their politics or their worldviews that they don't even know how to talk to each other, and then stand in the middle and invite both sides to come close. Do you hear how this call then is for all of us? Let us go. Because early one morning, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, Mark tells us that Jesus set the pattern, the layout line for all of us. Let us go, he said. Amen. I invite you to stand as together we affirm our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.
Let us join together to pray for the needs of the world and of this community. Let us pray. Lord, we gather and come before you as your people with hope and with gratitude, but with also all of our doubts and our fears. And we take this time now together to voice those things that are on our hearts, to pray out loud, to pray silently. This morning, we pray for all of those who are suffering from war or from natural disaster, and remember all of those who have been affected by flooding and by fires. Grant them your peace and send relief. We're aware of so many needs this morning, Lord. We pray for parents and grandparents and friends. We pray for faculty and for staff. We remember before you this morning individuals who are sick and in need of healing. We pray for those who are suffering. For those who are undergoing treatment. For those struggling with addiction. Heal the sick. Strengthen and sustain those who suffer by your presence and bring peace to the dying. Send us to bear your light and to bring your peace into the lives of others. We pray this morning for our friends who grieve and for ourselves. May they and we know the comfort of your love and the peace of your presence. We pray for this town this morning and for our own towns and neighborhoods and families and watch over these places and these people in our lives. Help us to see and begin to meet some of these needs of our communities and of this community. Help us to reach out to others, to our neighbors, and not to remain behind our own closed doors. Heal the brokenness in our own families. Show each of us how we can bear your light where we are and where we live. Lord, we pray for this campus, for what we're doing here. Help us to draw closer to you each day. Give us the desire to live our lives as your faithful followers. And may our actions, our words, and our choices bring glory to you and send us out from this place as those called to demonstrate your love to others. We're grateful to you for your love for us, despite all of our flaws. We're grateful that you have called us together and brought us together for a common purpose. Thank you for this time that we have to pray together as your people and to worship you. Thank you for your son, Jesus, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Closing hymn is number 31. Please stand and sing with me. Let us with our gladsome mind praise the Lord who is so God. For God's mercy shall endure, ever faithful, ever sure. God. 
God with all commanding might, fill the new made world with light, for God's mercy shall endure, ever faithful, ever sure. All things living God does feed, with full measure meets their need. For God's mercy shall endure, ever faithful, ever sure. Let us with our gladsome mind praise the Lord who is so kind. For God's mercy shall endure, ever faithful, ever sure. Thank you so much for letting me spend a bit of the morning with you. I wish for you, I pray for you this day to have a good day. A day filled with the love of God. The community that is bound together by the Holy Spirit that calls us, rescues us, carries us forward. Because we know first and foremost Jesus Christ our Lord. So in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.